song, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Dan Friedel. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, the coronavirus pandemic caused factories to close, forced people out of work, and resulted in economic recessions for much of the world. However, the health crisis also created a chance for 40 people to join the list of the world's richest. Forbes magazine released its yearly list of the world's billionaires on Tuesday. The U.S.-based magazine found that even with the pandemic, 2020 was a record-setting year for the world's wealthiest. Forbes found that a record 493 people became billionaires last year, or about one new billionaire every 17 hours. The list now has 2,755 billionaires. It is the most ever since the magazine started publishing the list 35 years ago. The magazine found that the billionaire's wealth is worth about $13.1 trillion. That is nearly the size of the 2019 gross domestic product of China, the world's second largest economy. And the number is as large as the combined GDPs of Japan, Germany, Britain, and South Korea. That information comes from the World Bank. Among the new billionaires on the Forbes list are 40 people who made their money from companies involved in fighting COVID-19. Some are connected to the vaccines that they helped develop in record time. They included Ugar Zahin, who helped create the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and Stefan Bonsell of Moderna. Some vaccine companies have been so successful that they produced several billionaires last year. Both American company Moderna and China's CanSino Biologics now have four billionaires each. CanSino developed a one-shot COVID vaccine that was approved by Chinese health regulators in February. Others got rich, Forbes said, by making personal protective equipment, tests, antibody treatments, and software to deal with COVID-19. All of them are needed to reopen the world's economies and return to normal life. The richest of these new billionaires is Li Jiankan, Forbes said. He is the president of Chinese medical products manufacturer Winner Medical. The company makes face coverings and medical clothing for healthcare workers around the world. Li is said to be worth $6.8 billion. Jeff Bezos of Amazon remains the richest person in the world with an estimated wealth of $177 billion. Several others join Bezos in the list of super-rich people with more than $100 billion. They include Elon Musk of Tesla and SpaceX with $151 billion, Bernard Arnault of the French luxury goods company LVMH with $150 billion, and Microsoft's Bill Gates with $124 billion. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg just missed the list with $97 billion. The list of richest women also increased during the pandemic. 
there are now 328 women compared to 241 last year. One of the richest women is Mackenzie Scott, $38 billion after her marriage to Jeff Bezos ended in 2019. The amount of money she has grew to $53 billion. During the pandemic, Scott became the world's biggest philanthropist. She gave away $5.8 billion last year to support activist groups for equality, education, and public health. Scott said she planned to give away most of her wealth. Schools across the United States now must decide how to spend federal aid money meant to help them fully open after the coronavirus pandemic. They also want to deal with problems that existed long before the coronavirus. Congress approved about $123 billion in assistance last month. The aid legislation will offer some school districts several times the amount of federal money they receive in a single year. The aid will help schools reopen and expand summer programs to help students catch up. Some will also start programs that had been too costly, such as intensive tutoring, mental health services, and curriculum improvements. Nathan Cooter is Chief Financial Officer of Boston Public Schools, which is expecting $275 million. He told the Associated Press that the current aid is a -a once-in-a-generation chance for his schools to make serious investments. But the spending decisions carry risks. If important needs get little attention, schools could be criticized by their communities and politicians who influence their funding. They could also face criticism if the money does not bring measurable improvements. At the same time, schools must be careful not to take on costs that they cannot pay for in the long term. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said the aid lets schools deal with issues that have hurt the nation's education system for a long time. He said schools can train teachers in social and emotional learning and work to end racial inequities in education. With successful implementation, our students are going to have a better experience than they did before the pandemic, Cardona said. Districts with higher rates of poverty will get the largest amounts. Public schools in some cities are expected to get more than $1 billion. They include Los Angeles and Philadelphia. The new money is in addition to more than $67 billion made available to schools through other aid legislation during the pandemic. Schools are required to keep 20% for summer programs. But they expect to decide how to use most of the rest. With more than three years to spend the money, school leaders have big plans. Officials in Boston said the aid will be used to reopen, recover, and reimagine what is possible for our students, Cooter said. The money will help renew aging buildings, but it could also be used to start new language programs 
or to improve what students learn, he said. Officials also plan to ask people in their districts what changes they want. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, where 83% of students come from families living in poverty, the district expects to get $120 million. That is nearly three times the amount it gets in federal education aid in an average year. Along with building improvements, the aid will help provide summer programs and after-school care in every neighborhood, officials said. Deborah Gist is the top official for Tulsa Public Schools. She said her district is thinking about how to bring about lasting change. School officials in Hartford, Connecticut, say they have made a list of must-win spending areas. Leslie Torres Rodriguez leads the school district there. She plans to expand learning outside the normal school day. She also plans to bring in new teachers and increase the activities of schools in their communities. The district also hopes to buy new teaching materials for all subjects and grades. It is something that we've never been able to do, Torres Rodriguez said. Although the aid brings a lot, for some districts, questions remain about future finances. Some states have cut education budgets because they have less income. Other states are likely to follow. To keep future costs under control, many schools are avoiding big hiring increases. Instead, many will consider adding teachers under short-term agreements or hiring contractors to do social and mental health services. In Virginia Beach, officials are considering whether to add teachers under one-year contracts. They are interested in hiring retirees or others without teaching experience. The district is also exploring whether to train current teachers in high-demand subjects. And they are thinking about whether to add mental health services through a virtual health provider. Among schools, the top goal is to get students back in the classroom. In Detroit schools, much of the aid will be used on schools' airing systems and to pay the costs of smaller classes and social distancing. Some of the money is expected to go towards special pay for teachers to return to the classroom. The aid for U.S. schools is largely meant to deal with problems caused by more than one year of virtual learning. In some places, there is also a push to keep virtual schooling for some students. At Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland, officials are expanding summer learning but they also plan to start a virtual school for students with health concerns and those who did well with online classes. And in Akron, Ohio, Chief Financial Officer Ryan Pendleton said the money offers the chance to forever change education for the better. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Alice Bryant. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. 
Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We continue the story of America's 42nd President, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton took office in January of 1993. During his eight years as president, he appointed more women and minorities to the government than any president before him. He also appointed the second woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court. For the first two years of his presidency, Bill Clinton had a Congress controlled by members of his own party, the Democrats. Still, he failed in his efforts to pass legislation to reform the nation's health care system. During the presidential campaign, Bill Clinton had promised to help millions of Americans get health care coverage. This health care system of ours is badly broken and it is time to fix it. Despite the dedication of literally millions of talented health care professionals, our health care is too uncertain and too expensive, too bureaucratic and too wasteful. It has too much fraud and too much greed. We must make this our most urgent priority, giving every American health security, health care that can never be taken away, health care that is always there. He appointed his wife, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, to lead a committee to develop the plan. Critics argued that the plan would lead to socialized medicine. In the end, lawmakers decided that the plan would cost too much and would be too difficult to administer. But President Clinton found support on other issues, including crime-fighting legislation. The measure included money for hiring more police officers and building more prisons. Congress also passed his budgets for 1993 and 94 that reduced federal spending. But Clinton's relations with Congress became more difficult after the 1994 congressional elections. The fight over health care and other issues had only led to greater dissatisfaction with Washington. The elections were a big defeat for the Democrats in Congress. The rising tide lifts all boats, so they say, and the Republicans are sailing right to victory in the House of Representatives. CNN estimating that the Republicans will take more than enough seats to take control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. And here's what's interesting. It is cutting across all regions. It is cutting across all ages. It is cutting across literally all the candidates. CNN reporter Frank Sesno. Voters gave Republicans control of both the Senate and the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. President Clinton supported welfare reform to reduce spending on public assistance. But he blocked Republican efforts to cut what he believed was too much money from programs including health care for retirees and the poor. Budget fights with the Republican-led Congress resulted in two shutdowns of government operations. The government is partially shutting down because Congress has failed to pass the straightforward legislation necessary to keep the government running without imposing sharp hikes in Medicare premiums and deep cuts in education and the environment. It is particularly unfortunate that the Republican Congress has brought us to this juncture 
because, after all, we share a central goal, balancing the federal budget. We must lift the burden of debt that threatens the future of our children and grandchildren. Unfortunately, Republican leaders in Washington have put ideology ahead of common sense and shared values. The economy had suffered a recession during the previous administration of George H.W. Bush. After Bill Clinton became president, the economy grew slowly at first, but then recovered more quickly. One month into his presidency, Bill Clinton had to deal with a terrorist attack against the United States. There's been an explosion deep below the 110-story towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. On February 26, 1993, members of Al-Qaeda attacked the World Trade Center in New York City. The terrorists left a truck loaded with explosives in an underground parking garage. By early afternoon, lower Manhattan looked like a war zone. Office workers, faces blackened with smoke and soot, hundreds gasping for breath, staggered into the frigid February air. The attack killed six people and injured more than 1,000 others. The government later captured those responsible for the bombing. On April 19, 1995, terrorists again struck the United States. Only this time, it was a case of homegrown terrorism. The target was the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It was an explosion blowing off the entire north face of that building. The bombing killed 168 people. It was the deadliest terrorist attack ever on American soil up to that time. The man behind the attack was Timothy McVeigh, a former soldier who hated the government. He was captured soon after the explosion. McVeigh was tried and in 2001 executed for his crimes. A friend of his, another military veteran, was also involved in the plot and was sent to prison. President Clinton also had to deal with foreign and humanitarian crises. A year ago, we all watched with horror as Somali children and their families lay dying by the tens of thousands, dying the slow, agonizing death of starvation. A starvation brought on not only by drought, but also by the anarchy that then prevailed in that country. President Bush had sent American troops to Somalia in 1992 to assist the United Nations in feeding starving Somalis. Civil war was preventing the people from receiving aid during a drought. In October of 1993, 18 American soldiers were killed in a battle in Mogadishu. It happened during a failed raid on a hotel to search for a militia leader. This past weekend, we all reacted with anger and horror as an armed Somali gang desecrated the bodies of our American soldiers and displayed a captured American pilot, all of them soldiers who were taking part in an international effort to end the starvation of the Somali people themselves. These tragic events raise hard questions about our effort in Somalia. Why are we still there? What are we trying to accomplish? How did a humanitarian mission turn violent? And when will our people come home? These questions deserve straight answers. Let's start by remembering why our troops went into Somalia in the first place. We went because only the United States could help stop one of the great human tragedies of this time. A third of a million people had died of starvation and disease. Twice that many more were at risk of dying. Meanwhile, tons of relief supplies piled up in the capital of Mogadishu because a small number of Somalis stopped food from reaching their own countrymen. Our troops created a secure environment so that food and medicine could get through. We saved close to one million lives. And throughout most of Somalia, life began returning to normal. 
Nearly a million Somalis still depend completely on relief supplies, but at least the starvation is gone. And none of this would have happened without American leadership and America's troops. Let us demonstrate to the world, as generation of Americans have done before us, that when Americans take on a challenge, they do their job right. But members of Congress demanded a withdrawal. A few days after the battle, President Clinton ordered American troops to leave Somalia within six months. In 1994, President Clinton sent troops to Haiti to return that country's first democratically elected leader to office. Military officers had overthrown President Jean-Bertrand Aristide three years earlier. That crisis led thousands of Haitian refugees to try to flee to the United States by boat. In 1995, American diplomatic efforts, as well as NATO airstrikes, helped produce a peace agreement to end the long and bloody civil war in Bosnia. President Clinton sent American peacekeeping troops to the former Yugoslav Republic. In November of 1993, Congress approved NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. The agreement ended most import taxes between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. It lowered barriers to the flow of goods, services, and investments. President Bush had signed the agreement with Mexico and Canada. American labor unions and environmental groups opposed NAFTA, but Congress approved it, and President Clinton signed it into law. Personal issues from Bill Clinton's past in Arkansas became part of his future as President of the United States. In the late 1970s, he and Hillary Clinton had invested in a land development company in Arkansas called Whitewater. Others involved with Whitewater were in legal trouble by the time Bill Clinton, a former governor of Arkansas, became president. A former judge who owned a savings and loan bank accused Clinton of pressuring him to make illegal loans to help the company. Clinton denied that. And there were questions and accusations about Hillary Clinton from the years when she worked as a lawyer in Little Rock, Arkansas. In January of 1994, after a year as president, Bill Clinton asked Attorney General Janet Reno to appoint an independent investigator. The Attorney General named a Republican, Robert Fisk, to look into the activities of the Clintons. But critics accused him of being too friendly to the administration. In August, three federal judges replaced him with another Republican lawyer, Kenneth Starr. Public opinion was divided about the situation. Some people thought the president and his wife were corrupt. Others thought any accusations of wrongdoing were nothing more than political attacks. Bill Clinton went on to win a second term in the elections in November of 1996. But new issues about his personal behavior would lead Republicans to try to remove him from office. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 